<clears throat> if you're not actively trying to expand your consciousness, there is an almost irresistible urge to whine and complain. To whine and complain. <laughs> Could that be construed as a hint? Can you get a gun back in a bullet once it's been fired? <laughs> the reason you read of no mystical sailors in the public history of exploration is that they never leave maps. Okay. And the reason they never leave maps is because they did not use any. No. <laughs> <clears throat> I know, I know, I know. That can't be so, and you're right. Well, you're kind of right, and you're kind of not right. Which itself is a reflection of how a nonlinear map would have to be folded if you had one. Mm -hmm. And wanted to take it with you. In your pocket. If you had one. <laughs> <clears throat> I had no pockets and complained until I met a man who had no pants. <laughs> and at first I felt ashamed for my previous whining until I realized that a man with no pants don't need no friggin' pockets. Does he? Of what intellectual importance is an individual if they think what everybody else thinks? But what if what everybody else thinks is correct, comprehensive, and enlightened? Well, that's a different matter. <laughs> Thus concludes today's episode of The Life and Times of Bozo the Super Clown. You know, the one you hope to die for your inanity. Uh, one man's approach involves three steps. First, you ask yourself what you think about being alive. And second, you ask yourself what it feels like to be alive. And then you can go to the third step. <clears throat> Stupidity. One size fits all. One man said, Stupidity strikes me as a rather harsh word, although I'm too dumb to know why. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, let's be genuine and clearly define stupidity. Stupidity is in not being as mentally active as possible. Such an understanding takes it from the realm of personal insult to an observation regarding vitality. So stopped and mused one man. If real morality equated to superior awareness, as does charity, tolerance, and compassion, then what amongst the arenas, what amongst the areas that make man unique do not also? None, concluded he, none. It is then on this basis that we have no provincial priest, no parochial historians, no sectarian psychiatrists, and no illiberal leaders. The third law of the collective civil jungle is that wolves are but led by wolves. Mm -hmm. Anything beyond that, you own your own. <laughs> there is a well-guarded belief among a group of top physicists that progress in all areas of science would be accelerated if the eradication of modifiers was possible. <laughs> the king thought, complex sentences are for commoners. Consistency, an underwater survey, is a man's ceaseless efforts toward awakening, static and moribund, is a ship's rudder so? Of course, as contrasted with ordinary's relationship to their consciousness, any confident captain is minutely familiar with the mechanics of his vessel's steering. Point, counterpoint. 
Anyone who exercises is an idiot. Anyone who thinks more than they have to is a fool. We plan to broadcast a three-sided debate on this subject, but the rehearsal of Sane blew out the Cordulian nion filters in our camera so repeatedly that we were forced to leave it at these two. <laughs> there was once a man who was quite entangled with the affairs of man until he realized what was going on, which mentally is nothing. <clears throat> if you wish to test a fish's complaints with water, offer to take him out of it. <laughs> it is perfectly permissible for anyone in the trades of religion, medicine, mar marital relationships, or mental health to hold this up metaphorically next to their activities for the sake of whatever. But if you do, don't come to me later looking for unemployment compensation. Ah, <laughs> oh, Lester, don't be so hard on the boy. <laughs> Well, how'd you feel if someone sat on your mandolin? <laughs> the mass parade. The middle of the road is safe. The middle of the road is sane. Living in the middle of the middle road will keep you believing in your name. From a worm's view, to be more conscious is to lose your mind while actually losing nothing. One aspect of man's collective intellectual progress is in narrowing down the possibilities. This serves science well enough, but is almost antipodal to a mystical man's private interest. Everything's based on a theory. Men believe some theories are better than others. That is their theory. <laughs> Everything's based on a theory. Out on his make-believe book promoter, a reporter asked the mystical author, what has been your major influence? Being alive, he replied. <laughs> Guilt. Caterpillars on the nervous system. <laughs> Transcendental researching. There is a source of info into which one can plug that requires no modem or library card. How come the enlightened don't write? How come the awakened don't read? How come mystics don't make the cover of Sports Illustrated? <laughs> In monasteries do monks sit and drowsily dream of what is going on at the Playboy Mansion, while somewhere libertines in passing flirt with notions of spiritual redemption. I, Justice, Justice, wherefore art thou, sweet Justice? I'm right here. <laughs> well, drats. <laughs> Expanded consciousness thinks not of fairness, e equity, and justice in that it be such. The simple have litter boxes. The more complex, thought. <laughs> Status report. The reflection of one observer. As long as criminals remain heroes, I know that man is still marching at the same old tempo. <laughs> Seen from a position of expanded understanding, the less a man actually accomplishes in life, the larger physical monument he wants to leave after death. A mystic's guide to whining. Act on it or shut up. Today's transcendental grammar lesson. Don't let consciousness be where the mind stays at. A stick in the ground is still a stick in the ground, whether it be a maypole, a sort of victory, a boundary marker, or a stick in the ground. How many times must the same train be announced? Anyway, three alternative potential protocols. You can do the right thing because someone told you you should. 
Or you can do the right thing because you believe it's the right thing to do. <laughs> or you can know what life's actually about and then nature will take its course. <laughs> the either and not of it. You're either original or you're not. <laughs> Pursuant to some reading in the area of anthropological linguistics, one man paused and pondered, which did come first, speech or writing? Then settle a matter satisfactorily in his own mind with the question, well, have you ever heard of the Tongue of the Month Club? <laughs> to routine views, progress may be sweet, semi-sweet, or bitter. But don't make too much of it, for after all, if individual taste was valid criterion, on the top of each week's bestseller list would be six billion different cookbooks. And that such a possibility is incomprehensible to mundane minds, life provides for the masses non-personal standards via the numerous institutions to relieve the individual of such pressure. As you may pretty quickly suspect, a few scattered here and there don't see this potential relaxation and grant of exemption in the same favorable light as do the ordinary. Some exercise their body, some try, some try to their mind. The more awakened do so in their whole friggin' system. Mm -hmm. Now today's made simple time on the show. Awakened consciousness is like active thought as opposed to the normal passive. In making things simpler, always lurks the danger of causing men to go down to the sea in ships and not find any sea. But hey, don't blame me. <laughs> Reality writ small. Life makes the local so the simple can have examples. Yeah. And apparent exculpatory exceptions to the universal. Huh. See, that, that's real sincere religious people. I hate to interrupt myself. Out, out. Asking life, you know, count me out. <laughs> Which is, if you've never thought about it, is what 99% of what you and your people call prayers. Mm -hmm. Supplications to greater forces is, hey, count me out. <laughs> <laughs> You're right, you know. I am so important to deserve absolute banishment from any part of reality. But here we go back. They told me that if I interrupt again with this written material, with that kind of improvisation, that my ass was out of here. How to kill someone without leaving a trace of evidence. Tell them what to think. No. How to live and die without leaving a trace. Let them. Today's enlightenment. The next morning sun just over the horizon. Justice is only visible against the full backdrop of the universal. Reasonable mental expectations have the disastrous potential of keeping you reasonable. <laughs> <laughs> Similar to pornography, said one man, I can't define what a porcupine is, but I know one when I see it. <laughs> the irrelevant can be as useful to an alert mind as anything else. And upon a closer examination, even Ahab was forced to exclaim, well, quiver me timbers. <laughs> Comedians. People who once thought they saw something, then laughed it away. Critics. Men who were originally comedians, but couldn't bear the pressure. <laughs> Reporters, people who once stepped in shit and thought, gee, I can make a living at this. <laughs> Priest, men who agreed with them but thought they should split the tape. <laughs> Anything that can be described can be D. 
described. In the thoughts of the awakened, all examples are generic in that they locally exemplify nothing apart from the universal. If it's not instant and extemporaneous, it's not original. Happy men don't care, but the really happy ones know why they don't. <laughs> For those of you tuning in on your shortwave radios, I will point out again that all of this is actually about what has been called the experience of enlightenment, the state of a more conscious, uh, of, an awake, of an expanded state of consciousness. But after you say that, if you do talk about it for a minute, it's, well, I'll talk about it for a minute to prove my own example. Uh, the reality is what everybody has always imagined, even those who never particularly dwelled upon the idea. It's just simply, whatever you had in your life, think about the best sex you ever had. I always hate to drag that in, but the best sex, the best drugs, the tippiest, the dopiest, the happiest you've just ever been for no reason. Or any of you that had your, has been blackmailing any neurosurgeons and got hold of any of the kind of neurotransmitters in <clears throat> very substantial and condensed form and could inject it directly in your brain if you knew how. This thing, this state, just makes all that look like kindergarten. Mm -hmm. It is just the most fun you just can't describe it, which is why, as I said, I spent uh, a minute. That's it. So then the point is the other 59 minutes of this taping has to be taken up with a kind of <laughs> metaphorical reference there too. But that because I've said it's the happiness. It's it. It's just those who, if that's what they want, even when they don't know what it is, then once they have it, they go, well, that was it. You know, there's, you know, and there's no doubt about what you paid, no matter how long it took, how you fund the disgraces of your family and your friends, and you, and you, you ruined your health and your life and lost all your money. <laughs> That's what those who don't make it imagine it would cost. That was one of the last ones, if you notice, was happy men don't care. Happy people just don't care. But really happy, which is enlightened people, they know why. All right. On the road, somewhere between here and there is what we talk about for the other 59 minutes. I was going to point out there's a way in which you could see originality itself as being a true mystical discipline, a mystical method. But let me show you the difference the way the mind normally works. I know that many people think they're original or people believe that they're involved with some sort of scientific or soft science research and psychology or sociology or any other field of human activity, intellectual activity. But there is a kind of distinction between these kind of original observations, this kind of original thought that I'm referring to, and what normally is thought of conceived of as being good thought. There's several real distinctions that you can, well, they're easy for me to put in words. Then the problem is, it's back in your court. And you've got to think, well, it's got to be more than it sounds like. Very likely or less. The difference is what people ordinarily observe or say that they observe about life uh, by its own definition that I'm, inferring is never original. It is always in response to something they've heard. It is always an agreement with something they've heard which makes them feel more confident intellectually. If they've just read some new observation in psychology today or psychology yesterday and it says, here's something new we've discovered and you look around life or you read the article and you think, wait a minute, my Uncle Carl acts like that. And it makes people, just ordinary, simple-minded, intellectual, educated people feel better. Because here it is, a magazine that costs, my God, probably two ninety five by now, with this important observation made by a person with credentials and a suit and tie and lots of help and statistics. 
And as soon as you read it, you just immediately saw the truth therein. I mean, are you a brain or what? All it took was someone to point this out, and you went, by God, that's true. And at least you can always, if you're just walking around intelligent, come up with a local example. My Uncle Carl, I'll be damned. I mean, there it is. And I don't know why these people, these atomic physicists still working on trying to discover the general theory of everything. Your Uncle Carl. <laughs> Any simple-minded person's Uncle Carl is... There it is. There's the general theory of everything. <laughs> and if you think, well, wait a minute, I'd like to apply this to some other area. Fine. Shift it right over, and it's still, it's always Uncle Carl. I used to work with, or if you don't like Uncle Carl, I used to work with a guy like that. That's the general theory of everything. I used to go with a girl like that. There it is. Well, non-original thought is never original, so I'm sure we've covered that. Another distinction is, well, there are two that I was going to try to hit. One, one of the two is that the kind of original, out of the ordinary observation and thinking I'm referring to now, in no wise requires that a person speak of it as one. And the other one is, it's useless. Now, let's see, which one would we like to attack first? Neither. Okay. Well, do you realize what has happened to the uh, salary cap that was being discussed in the uh, National Hockey League? Let us say that someone is observing. You're riding along. And I just, I'm going to make up one, which is always dangerous because if I make it up, I'll bet you that we could drive out now and find Psychology Today magazine. And by some magic, it would not have been in there right now. Let's assume the new, the new issue is laying on the newsstand down the street. You people think I don't believe in magic and all that hookahs, what do you call it, hoochie-coo, hookahs po hookahs pocus. <laughs> that, Indian, that Indian magician, hocus pocus, new age hocus pocus. Right now, in the issue of Psychology Today, there is nothing about what I'm about to mention, but as soon as I say it, don't ask me to explain it, it's very likely, it is possible, you go down and buy the issue as soon as we get through here, and there'll be something in there about it. I cannot explain it. I can, but I won't. I, so we'll leave it at, I can't explain it. So I'm going to make up an observation I'm, that I'm hoping is not yet in the issue. <laughs> all right, besides the, all the little laughter. Now, I'm going to make up something. I, there's a certain, I hate to brag on myself, there's a certain small art to being able to make up something that no one has ever observed before. And it's just spooky enough, it's just on the cusp enough of observable, conceivable reality that some of you may get it or some of you may go, what? Which if we get half and half, that's we're about up to my average batting score. Yeah. Let's say you're riding along, let's, you make this observation. It just comes to you. It happens... It's how you drive your car a lot. And it, you observe people walking along the, the streets and highways of life throughout the years. And one day, it just strikes you. You're walking along, and the sound of a car seems to have certain effects on some people. And suddenly, it strikes you. As the people walking along the highway of life, those that just apparently to you, of the lower class, are more likely to turn and look every time a car goes by. If anybody was interested, I could do all sorts of things. I could talk for a month about, <laughs> about the implications and the kind of arguments that I was going to get to also about how certain forms of progress or what can be seen as progress from one view can also be seen as nothing but a rear guard holding action from another view, and yet it does seem like progress. And this would be one since I just... But here we go. Well, I was thinking about all the arguments you could make. The first one from ordinary people would be, well, wait a minute. Even if there's some basis for what you say, which I'd probably... I, I can't, I don't know any statistics you know, that even refer to that. And you're right. But they go, well, wait a minute, there's a, an immediate fallacy I see is how many upper class people do you see walking the highways of life? <laughs> <laughs> Which as I said, I already, there is a Capricornian amount of material there 
Because that would sound like, wait a minute, they got you. Because it's unfair to make such a conclusion that the, the lower classes, just the general economic, social lower classes, of the people walking up down the highways of life as you're driving by, the lower classes, the poorer, the lower class the person is, the more likely when they hear the sound of a car that they always look over their shoulder. And the person go, wait a minute. It's only the lower classes that are out walking the highway. And it sounds like they got me, right? Oh, yeah, they would. Because that was what I was inferring. I know that's not making a lot of sense, but hey, it doesn't cost any more than when it don't. Normally, it doesn't make any sense on the main subject. That would sound like a progressive attitude that, wait a minute. You know, you can't make a, just a blanket comment like that because the flaw is immediate. It might take them 10 or 15 seconds being, you know, <laughs> the, the, the intellectual, you know, whippersnappers, you know, dead eye shots they are, they go, wait a minute, no, 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 no. Wait a minute, that's a flaw there. I mean, besides the fact that I don't think you have any credentials and you didn't offer any statistics, you just made an observation, which you know, that's not going to work here amongst us intellectuals. But on top of that, I see a flaw in the observation itself. To wit, how many upper class people, even middle class, are walking the highway? So I did that again to show you that I can make that kind of observation and then I can refute it from the collective majority view. But then if you can hear anything, you know that's not the answer. That is not the final word, but here we go. Let's say that you make such an observation. All right, let us say that somebody else did. Or let us say that you, if, if an ordinary person made that observation, they would have to talk about it. I just knew that we'd finally cut out all this laughter and this noise here in the room, and I finally hit it. If an ordinary person made even what seemed to them to be something approaching a, an original, personal observation, that they thought they turned around and observed something in life about humanity, about the nature of man, they could not resist. They would have to. It's part of it. They would have to speak of it. Uh, and not particularly on the point I was making tonight, but uh, within a graduation of how far afield it was from collective reality at the time, that is, conversely, how close it might even be approaching anything resembling minutely original thought. The more it gets to there, the more it will be out of hand dismissed by others and it would operate like this as soon as the person went, did you know I just thought about something? I, I just realized that the poorer you are, if you're walking down the street, the, the lower classes walking down the highways, they're the ones that they hear, they're the ones that go, try, always look around like, want to see who's coming or won't be seen. Or if, if that person said that, same thing that I made up, to ordinary people, maybe they're good drinking buddies, the kind of guys around the, the faculty at the school, their fellow fight, just ordinary people, somebody would absolutely, the, the closer it was to something even minutely resembling original thought, the more it would be dismissed. That is, and they have to speak about it. And here goes the dance. It's very short lived. They go, I just thought, the, blah, 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 blah. And that person go, God damn, are you crazy? And they go, yeah, I guess so. And that's the end of it. <laughs> and I just made it short and simple. But the other person, they, they could have made it a little longer like, that make him maybe repeat it once and go, oh, come on. You must have been drinking. Or they could have just looked at you like, well, you idiot. And with an ordinary person, when they had anything that was even minutely resembling original thought to them, to, like, I never heard this, I never thought it, I never heard anybody say yes or no, I never even heard anything about it. And, and they tell somebody their observation. But you understand, an observation is almost like asking collective reality, could we dance to this? That they're, in the, they're there in the middle of the ballroom where everybody thinks it's sane, it's all middle class, it's reality as it should be, and it's like a person is just close to something. It seems like an original observation, and it's almost like acting, asking collective life, sane reality, like, could we dance to this? And the whole population of the ballroom, they can do it, even non verbal almost. <laughs> they look like, are you serious? You go, oh, you're right, you're right. And that's the end of it. That is one of the reasons they must 
Talk about it. For those of you who forgot, that was what a, one of the things I was going to point out. When ordinary people believe that they're somewhere close to an original thought, and I, I don't mean this as a tricky premise to it, I'm just saying it's something that an ordinary person, not someone attempting to expand their own neural horizons, their own consciousness, but just an ordinary person when they, and it happens to people continually, which is part of the purpose that talk serves. It is an equalizing agent. It is a kind of self-regulating agency within the mainstream of life. It's a person here and there. It happens constantly. They get something that is a bit outside the mainstream of their local collective reality. And they may just, may just be their friend. Some guy they talk to at the office or their wife, husband, somebody, and they go, I was thinking, it seems like such and such about humanity or about certain kinds of people do certain things. And the, and the further it is out of the mainstream at that particular time and place, the other person, and you, they, they make it not as an observation. They don't say, ah, I had an, an instant, I had an enlightenment, I had a realization about humanity, about people, and here it is. It's not that. It's a question. It's an invitation. It's an invitation like, should I stop this? Is this insane? And they all look like, well, you know it is. Could we dance to this? You know we can't. Is there, is there any possible validity of what I observe? Certainly not. Oh, good. And that's it. do si do Ergo, with all, and how about this? Outside of ordinary mainstream people, the Laos and the Zoroasters and the Buddhas and the Muhammads and the Abrahams and the Jesuses, the real mystics, when they observe something, they don't ever tell anybody. You observe it, and it just makes sense, and that's it. That's why somebody like me gets paid the big bucks I do buy them. <laughs> well, you know, I keep saying there's no conspiracy, no secret group, and you know damn well there is. Oh, who do you think pays me? They're the ones that, for, well, they always have somebody, and they say, all right, you go. I, I'm not going to tell you what kind of bet I lost that got me here, because it could have, well, hey, now it could have been somebody else. It's like this, you know, it's luck. Oh, it's so hard. It could have been one of the others. Well, all right, just to tell you a little insight, the guy who actually, we thought was about to lose, we made him shave his head and tattoo the ball part, so it could have been worse. I just ended up having to come out and talk about it. You find out yourself, back to the serious part. <laughs> Real observation, original observation, it has certain characteristics, and one of them is, is you feel no need to tell anybody. And I know there's a slight apparent description in that is, I know damn well since the position that doesn't have anything to do with me personally, but the position that I'm in of publicly talking about this, that people who feel like that I had some effect in, on some observation, they might think, God, I wish I could go tell him this. Or I wish he was here right now so I could just punch him and look, because I know he'd know what I was looking at, you know, whether I did or not, it's a, that you could just punch and go. <coughs> but other than that, what amounts to original thought or original observation is truly you see it such as mine. Just to give you something to think about, that you're riding along and you think, well, there are certain kinds of people in life I can make it more generic than the lower class of walking on the highway. Is that there's just more people? In, there's certain types of people in life that you can walk in a room and go, <clears throat> and there's some just immediately turn and look. But it's turn and look not on the basis of survival, animal instincts, but it's more on the basis of some sort of vanity. Is they're not really looking at you, they want to look and see that you're looking at them. Mm -hmm. And I'm just making all this because if you observed it, this kind of description is not all that necessarily specific. It's just you observe something original about people, and the payoff is, it's not to tell somebody, you don't even feel the need. The payoff is you see it, and you know it's original, and it all makes sense. I wanted to leave it there, but I don't know whether, it makes sense. You understand to you. But that's all that is necessary. That's all that's of any value to a real mystic. The other part, let me drag in the other part, is it's useless, Truly. All right, now think about it. All right, let's go back to my example. So we got, what if you told somebody, you said, uh, 
I've observed, and let's still assume that I made up a good example, that we've, nobody's ever made any kind of observation like that. There's just nothing even in a, there's just nothing in the body of psychology or sociology, that, nothing close to this. So let's say it's an original observation on some, that I made up. That you went and you told somebody, you said, I have noticed, you know, I drive a lot I'm in my car hours a day and I'm always passing people on the highway. And I've noticed some people will turn and look and some do not. And some just immediately turn and it's, it struck me. I don't know why I was never looking, I wasn't planning, but it just struck me that the lower the person is, of course you're taking you know, some leeway there in your insight that you can spot somebody. Mm -hmm. But you're saying, I have noticed those that are apparently of the lower eco economic social classes, the lower classes, they are the most likely, just as soon as I hear the noise behind them of a car, is to look. Right, now let's assume that the person you're talking to did not dismiss it out of hand. Let's assume that that's valid. Let's assume that that, and just for the sake of this, that it is a genuine observation. Let's assume that, okay? And it's new. Of what value is that? Now I'm talking about from any sane, ordinary view. None. If we had the mass, the collective sane mass of humanity, listen to that observation. <coughs> and let's assume that for some reason they did not dismiss it. <coughs> Just out of hand. And they thought about a second, what would be their attitude? Legitimately. Their attitude would be, all right, if that's so, which we're not saying, it, but if that's so, what in the hell good is that? <coughs> and you can truly make up, as you can go ahead and join in with me. None. Absolutely none. What possible good could you, you what's that good for? Nothing. That is one of the, it sounds strange, I pulled it before, and I know it, you can almost dismiss it when you hear it the first time, but that is one of the characteristics I should say it should be one of the tacit characteristics, but it is one of the real characteristics nonetheless of original observation, original thought. The compared to uh, ordinary utilitarian purposes, it has none. It doesn't, well, it gets stranger if you were ordinary and I pursued that verbally, but it, it does not mean that all the observations or everything that someone sees in a more awakened state is useless, contrary to the person that experiences it, they go, well, finally. Forty years, but boy, what a bargain. That's all I can tell you. Is you nobody, nobody has ever reached that state and asked for their money back. <laughs> nobody who ever did it ever tried to go dig up Buddha and punch him in the nose. The very few things I will guarantee, but that's one of them. Yeah. And so it's not that what you see and understand is useless, contrary, except there's no way to explain it. What I want you to see is that that is one of the characteristics of original thought. Because if it, was any, if it was of any instant value to ordinary consciousness, to ordinary awareness right now, they would have already made it. From a more complex view, what they call of any value is open to question. Well, it's not open to question, it's just not so. Why beat around the old tree? What anybody else has already thought is of no interest. It's of no value. The nourishment is gone. And so therefore, if you can follow this kind of <clears throat> logic, you can see that per force of original thought on the premise I just laid, it's got to be useless. Because if it had any apparent ordinary routine value right now to men, someone would have already thought it. So there, you could see originality, once you know what I'm talking about, as truly a mystical discipline, as a mystical method. Somewhere this side of the experience, it, I put it right on the same historical level as meditation and trance dancing, uh, prayer, you know, anything that you ever thought of that you thought might have some effect, trying to Meditate, trying to calm the mind, trying to control attention, trying to loose attention, trying to think one thing at a time, trying to think everything at a time. This is the same thing. It all, each of them will eat up the other one. Or each of them can sit next to the other one and have it for dinner.
<coughs> but originality would be one. The observation is always useless. It has no practical value from an ordinary man's view. This is not the reason why you don't talk, but that is also one of the characteristics is when you are engaged in original observation. Or if you want it more hookus pookus, when you are engaged in truly metaphysical type thought, that which you see, it simply makes sense. You're pleased. I like make sense. You look at it and you go, ha! Ah. It's, it's not the big ah, you know, the enlightenment, but it's a small ah. I mean, what the hell you want? You're driving to work, you know? <laughs> and there it is, you're driving on the highway, and here for the umpteenth thousand time, a guy walking down the highway hears your car and goes, and you suddenly make an observation that no human on this planet has ever made, which is what it amounts to, that no human has ever thought this exact sentence. Which they think all, that's all common words. It strikes you. The lower class the person is, the more likely they are to turn around and look. A passing car, a car coming up behind them. All common words used almost every day by almost everybody. But I'm telling you, that kind of observation, you would be the first human on this planet. Notwithstanding Buddha, Confucius, Socrates. You would have been the first person to think that thought, to observe that. But it is useless, except when you see it. You don't think, well, it's useless or not. You see it, and it's the small pleasure. It's the small, huh? Not the big one. Of course, it could trigger it in some way, for those of you who like to hear that kind of thing. But what I mean is, if it's just, well, if it's just, well, I don't blame you. Well, everybody does like to hear it because you keep thinking, you know, the trigger, the trigger, the trigger. <laughs> The observation itself, assuming it does not suddenly take you away, just the observation is its own reward. And it requires, you do not have any desire to speak of it. You don't even think about speaking of it. After this, if we were that mundane about it all, you could say, well, you've already explained, and I realize what you said, you already explained it. It'd be a waste of time to tell anybody. That's not why you don't tell anybody. Which would be a good reason if you could be that stupid and that insightful simultaneously, which is possible. <laughs> but that's not why. It's simply that you, the desire to describe it, the desire to speak of it, is not a part of the original observation. They do not go hand in hand. But contrary, I want to repeat it to you again because this is part of your everyday mental operation. You and everyone else tied into the great collective neural system is observations, even though that, I say even though, with, from an ordinary view, they would say, forget even though, they would go especially. That is, any time a, a person thinks they've had an original thought, it didn't cross their mind not to try to share it. Mm -hmm. Like I said, they could believe, well, I would, maybe this will make me famous. And here and there, it can make somebody's reputation. But what it normally does is keep the equilibrium, is to keep the low common denominator, the low water level of everybody. Is that you have something approaching original thought, and you tell somebody like, I just thought so-and-so might be true. And it's like the whole ballroom stops in your locale. The music and everything stops and looks like, well, you know, like, it, like somebody farted at a funeral. Or, you know, that kind of... <laughs> And now I'll look at you and you go, oh, I, well, I guess I was wrong. Sorry. You know, and everybody goes back to doing it, and that's the end of it. You never think it again. You think, you know, another close call. That's sort of why it's funny. Not ha-ha, of course, but the other kind that I keep pointing out not to make historical hash browns. Or not to break hash browns out of historical potatoes. <laughs> but it's, once you understand, it's, it's somewhat of the, oh, good-natured humor, un unrecognized humor of people believing that we have the words of great awakened men of the past. That we actually have. We, have. we have people that sit there next to Buddha and wrote down what he said, or Jesus, or Abraham. Right. I already told you about that. Their job was one thing, 
was to make his life seem more interesting than it was, assuming they're going to try to make a living out of it. That's it. But the idea that he left an actual map, that's kind of funny. You believing it's even kind of funnier. <laughs> How about this? I, well, I know. You know I'm just being funny, funny, funny. But if it was true, if it was true that these awakened men left stuff like that, and I know it's enjoyable to read at a certain level, but if that was actually it, how come you can't read it and go, and that be it? And speaking on behalf of, of all sane would-be mystics, I'd like to go, well, that doesn't make any sense. Thank you. <laughs> or if that won't fly, I can do better. Hey, won't you shut up? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> of course, if they had any potential to be a real mystic, I'd say to their mind in private, I'd say, why don't you shut up? And that might be the trigger. I will not, however, since I have an important engagement tomorrow, hold my breath in anticipation of self-same occurring. Thank you. Everything that's of any value to a man had to be original. And after that, it's like me trying to talk, me or anyone trying to talk about the experience of awakening or enlightenment. You can say something like, yeah, it exists, and, you know, nobody ever asks for their money back. And after that, everything else is just, I'm beginning to ramble. It's bullshit. It's harmless palaver. After you say originality of thought, what can you say? Now, I know I have said 55 minutes worth, but you can't really say anything because there's nothing you can say about originality. After you say the word originality, anything after that is stepping in shit. <laughs> Everything after that begins to distract from the concept of originality. Because if I say, well, all right, let's go back to this. If I said... You could look at a true mystical discipline, never put this way, but a true mystical approach would be originality. <coughs> and a sincere, interested person would go, well, that's intriguing. Well, well, tell me some more. I mean, what do you mean by originality? I go, well, okay. <laughs> You've just stepped in it. I mean, what are you going to say about originality? <laughs> well, all right, I'll, let me see if I can say this. <laughs> well, I know I can say something, but what is it? If you say anything else, you're certainly not anywhere near the arena. Oh, maybe you're outside. But you're not really back, you're not still in the arena of originality because anything I say about it, what if you go, wait a minute, wait, can you talk slower so I can write this down? Now think about that. We're not here. We're not here now. This is not a friar's roast of Captain Sarcat, what is it? Captain Irony. It's not that, but think about it. The presentation. I'm presenting a whole new mystical system, a whole new approach. It's based upon one key element and one only, originality. And there's a hush, a small gasp. And maybe someone says, could you say something else? And I said, well, all right, next, wait, let me get my pad. That's not making fun of you or anyone else because I've already made fun of people who can actually think originally. If you want to look at them making fun, I've already pointed out to you that anything, that anybody, and I didn't make exceptions, but anything a man has thought twice, it's a waste of time. At the ordinary view, that's just moot. That's irrelevant. But to someone attempting to do something extraordinary, anything you've already thought, forget it. That's figure of speech. You don't have to forget it. All right, forget it. And while you're at it, do not ever again think, don't ever let cross your mind to picture a Brazilian taper with green hair <laughs> and a banana in his mouth. All right, don't, don't ever do those things. And you're certainly more close than on the road to what you call it, you know, that kind of superior condition thing, state. <laughs> But if you, if you ever think about warthogs with limps and bananas in their mouth, well, you, all right, you watch me. You, think, you, you watch. You cannot do that and at the same time experience enlightenment. Mm -hmm. 
It just, it just bars it. So, if you don't believe it, test it. <laughs> For those of you on the other side of the universal room here, don't do it and see what happens. No. And as always, I believe that we have succeeded in at least spreading in a fair and equitable manner severe migraines in at least 50% of the audience. <laughs> Half of the other 50%, I believe, just left. <laughs> Took a nap, went to sleep. Reaching for their notepad to make important notes having to do with originality. <laughs> uh, let me try this. Even though it probably made very little sense. I said that the original observation I just made up about those walking along the highways, that is those of the lower class, the lower the class of the person, just by any, I'm just using that in this ordinary sociological sense, that the lower class of the person, the more likely they are to turn and look at the sound of an oncoming automobile. Not only is that useless, it has a potential, and I don't mean just because I was using words like lower class, I could have made up anything, so I don't mean that just because of that. But anything that is a non, anything that's approaching an original observation, if in some way you had an arena that someone, a large number of people would entertain it, that you could trick them some way and show up and actually have fake credentials or say you had this great new observation, you had a fake name, you lifted some, the name of some famous psychiatrist that just died last week, nobody knew it here in Butte and that you could trick them into showing up, and you say, well, here it is, and you gave them that observation, they would take, as we say here in Montana, EU, extreme umbrage, or even EE, extreme exception, and not even know why. They'd go, wait a minute. And somebody would want to stand up and say something. Nowadays, it's called political correctness, for one thing, or social, well, political correctness in 1995 is when we were doing this. But it's always been what it is is the collective sensation of the local reality of humanity that, wait a minute, any kind of observation that is too out of the ordinary is either, it's probably perverse or it's probably, uh, uh, it's regressive, it is illiberal, something's wrong with it. And they're never sure why, but, well, I say they're not sure why. They could probably take that on the surface. Like I said, I happen to just make up when they go, wait a minute, you're making some kind of you're making some kind of class observation that is outmoded. Because for one thing, you insensitive boob, for one thing, I didn't really talk like that here in Montana. But I can take it. All right. You insensitive boob, the upper classes don't have to walk the highway. So sure it's easy to say, well, it's only the lower classes, or they're the most likely to try and look at an oncoming automobile. Who else is walking the highway? How dare you? Sorry. It just so happened that worked out. Anyone I picked out, it could have sounded religious. It could have been more on a sociological basis. It could have been on a uh, professional basis. It could have been on any kind of basis of an observation. And the closer it got to a hand gesture, not a hand gesture, to an original idea, something out of the mainstream, the more ordinary sane people are going to, if, you, if you've got the nerve to say it, the more vociferously they will object to it. And on bases that seem progressive. <laughs> We're obviously not going to get around to it. And who said thank God? <laughs> that, it, was, it was tied to it. <laughs> Man looks like a communist banker to me anyway that said that. <laughs> well, it was either that or a socialist ballet dancer. <laughs> I'll leave it to you as to which is the worst. <laughs> But the one, the other one I said that uh, there's a level at which things can be literally seen as progressive. And are, Anna are seen by the uh, collective as being progressive. That this is a movement forward in the general parade of man's civility. And it's true at that level. But there's another, another level at which this constantly is not, it can be seen that this constant action is not actually progressive. Is not really evolutionary. Now we're talking about, you understand, from a very singular, a very limited view. 
that is a mystics, that it is not actually progressive. It is a continual rear guard attempt at a holding action. It's like trying to keep the Philistines away from the door and simultaneously trying to keep the more awakened from the door. So what are you left with? You understand they're trying to keep the rats and the huns away from the gate, but simultaneously they're trying to keep away the eagles, the songbirds, uh, prophets, painters, because you can't have it both ways. And so therefore they have to call it one thing, but what are they trying to keep away? Original thought. It is disturbing. They don't know why. You know we're not picking on humanity or individual men or collective men. They don't know why. It's life. It's life going, hey, oh, man, come on, hey. <laughs> Believe in life. Life has got to keep its balance. And that's a figure of speech. Life is going to keep its balance. But I just being funny on life's behalf. To me. Well, life sometimes tells me, make me seem more human. <laughs> I do the best I can. But it's, life ha it's like life going, wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. And so therefore, anything approaching, well, you understand it's degrees. When it gets too close to original thought and observation, then it's like life says, you know, throw down big vats of boiling piss or, <laughs> or fat on the people outside the gate they're trying to get in. And you can say, well, who is it? You're just throwing it out indiscriminately. And you go, you don't know whether it's out there, whether it's Huns and barbarians or whether it's artists. I mean, you don't know who you're throwing out on Attila or St. Francis. And they say, doesn't matter, throw it. <laughs> Which one more time, if you'd like to know, is what accounts for this kind of activity being so darn popular? 